let's get to the word. So in the book of Haggai, chapter 2, we'll be starting at the third verse. When you got it, say, I got it. And this is King James, and it reads, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do ye see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord. And work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens, and the earth, and the sea, and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Skipping over to Acts chapter 9. Starting at the first verse and it reads, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, and if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined throughout about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And skipping over to verse 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Saints, for the next few moments, I would like to come from the subject and ask the question, what will you do in the aftermath? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. If I were to ask you what faith was, many of you would give me scripture and say, well, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Others might open up a dictionary and uh, look at Webster's and say, well, faith uh, is strong belief or trust in someone or something. And then more of you might just pull from the knowledge or intellect of your own minds and say, well, you know, faith is believing in something. And while all of those answers are correct, only one is the truth. I'll say that again. Even though all those answers are correct, only one is the truth. That's because when God speaks, when God makes promises, reality has to move to fit what he is saying. So God is just not, he's not commenting on what's happening around. He's not saying something because he's looked at it and seen the outcome. He's saying it because he has the desired outcome, because he himself has put that outcome in place. So when God speaks, there is power in his words. When God speaks, something is about to happen. When God speaks, something is about to move. When God speaks, the devil has to shut up. When God speaks, dead man rise to life. When God speaks, the old is made new. When God speaks, things happen. And you've got to understand that faith, it's not the same as just knowing something. 
as having knowledge of what has happened. Like you look into the Old Testament and you see what the Israelites went through. They literally saw manifestations of God right before them. And yet over and over and over in the Old Testament do you see them rebelling against God. And it's not that they didn't know that God existed, but it's because they did not have the belief and that faith in God to know to trust Him, to know to obey Him. So knowing something is not the same as having faith. Someone once told me, you know, God stopped performing miracles a long time ago. I said, no, he didn't. People just stopped having faith. You look about, look around when, when Jesus went to his hometown in Nazareth, and it says that he could not accomplish much there because of uh, the people's unbelief. Because they had seen Jesus grow up. Jesus was just a normal guy to them. And so when he came back to his hometown ready to minister and to touch the people, he could not do anything because of their lack of unbelief. And that word belief, that word faith, it, it, in Greek it's pisti. And it means good faith, trust, and reliability. So if Jesus came into Nazareth, Wanting to work miracles, wanting to minister to people. Why couldn't he? It's because there was no faith there. God acts in response to your faith. There's a saying that if there are a thousand steps to take, God will take 999 of them and he will leave the last one up to you. You see, it's, this relationship between us and God has to be a little bit more than one way. Yeah, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Yeah, Jesus is the atonement for everything wrong that we have done. And Jesus Christ did all the work to put us in this situation. But you have to be able to know God for yourself. You have to be able to to pray for yourself. You can't live off of the anointing of your parents. You can't live off of the sermons of your pastor. You can't live off of the prayers of everyone else for so long. You have to make it real between you and God. So what will you do in the aftermath? After the service is over, after the prayers have ceased, after you have gone home and you're sitting in your room, what will you do in the aftermath? Is your faith real? Is there a real connection there? Because anybody can get up here and, and fake tongues. Anybody can get up here and, and, and run around and, and jump and, and scream and holler. But when you go home, when you're around your friends, can you minister the gospel? Can you have your own prayer life? Can you do the things that God has called you to do? Do you even know that God has called you to do things? Do in the afternoon. I remember last summer, um, I remember waking up one morning and one of my friends had texted me and uh, she said, JC, did you see the news? And I said, no, I didn't sleep. And it, it's Saturday, it's 11 a.m. And I just woke up. It was early for me. And so I immediately just clicked on my phone and my phone was blown up. And I just found out that they had legalized same-sex marriage. And I said, wow, like for years and years, this has been a push in our society to, to legalize this, to make this more accepted, but never did I think that the United States Supreme Court would actually ratify it. And so I remember sitting on my bed and I said, I can either just sit at home uh, and do nothing about this, or I can proclaim the truth. And so I remember uh, getting on the Gospel of Christ Facebook page and just listing all the reasons as to why this was a wrong decision. But I did it in a way that was, was respectful, that was a, a way that was sharing my views. And at the end, I put, hey, you know, it's not the uh, unrepentable sin. Because without Jesus, a gay person and a person who's not gay are both going to hell. That's the reality of the situation. So I said, you know, you might have sinned, you might have fallen short, you might have done some things in your life that you're not proud of, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he can forgive you no matter what. And as soon as I posted that, I got death threats, I got uh, all these nasty uh, comments on, on the, uh, the page, and it was 
I've never felt that kind of persecution before just for sharing what I felt. But that post, that, I gotta make sure I got the right stats here, that post was shared enough times around the country that over 26,000 people saw it. So because one man took a stand, because one Christian who knew what God had ordained and what he had not ordained took a stand and said, no more, this is right and this is wrong, 26,000 people were exposed to the truth. And I think that's that's what we're lacking a lot here in today's church. You know, we've got too many weak Christians. we got too many Christians who are just willing to go to church on Sunday or Wednesday and say, that's enough. I fulfilled my duty to God. But God is calling soldiers. He's calling an army to rise up and take back his country, to take back his nation, to take back his world, and to proclaim the truth boldly. It's too many weak-minded Christians, too many Christians without a backbone saying, oh, I don't want to get into the middle of that. See, the, see, the, the, the word says that we can neither be hot or cold, or, I'm sorry, that we should be hot or cold, and that we cannot be lukewarm, or else God will spew us out. We have to pick a side of the fence. There's a lot of us just straddling the fence, not knowing where to go. There's a lot of us just uh, uh, content in sitting in sin, and God is saying, that is not what I have desired for you. You are called to go forth and to preach the gospel. You are called to go forth and minister to your friends. You are called to go forth and minister to your family. You are called to go forth and be the light in the workplace. You are called to go forth and to minister who I say to minister to, whether it be people on your job or people who belong to the group known as ISIS. I will send you where I need you, and I need you to be willing and able to know that all the earthly work may be done by you, but all the praise, honor, glory, and thank you belong to him, because he is God. Saints, many times in our lives we find that we go through perilous tribulations. We go through times where things aren't so great. When we're kind of down in the muck and the mire of the world, and these are times maybe when we lose loved ones, or, or times maybe at the loss of, of a job, a financial burden, times when we have family issues and uh, things are going on at home, times when we're feeling alone and, and insecure and distressed, and we don't think that there's any way out. And then there are times of blessings, times of jubilance, where God has blessed us maybe with elevation or promotion, and uh, praise God for that. There are times where we have accomplishments and accolades that we achieve. There are times where we have reconcili reconciliation and remembrance. But in both times, good or bad, the Bible says that I will bless the Lord at all times, and that his praises shall continually be in my mouth. And I know that's that's a lot easier said than done. You don't really want to want to praise God when, when you're going through something. Because a lot of the times you think, hey, uh, I'm going through something. That must mean God is not there. Hey, I'm going through something. That must mean God does not exist. But the truth is that we're really not seeking him in those times. And even when we have blessings, even when God opens up the storehouses of, of glory upon us, then we kind of forget about him and say, oh, I got you all by myself. Oh, I got this title all by myself. Oh, I got that cheer all by myself. And we forget that God is the one who has brought us that far. Because if I can be a friend for a moment. I should not be here today. You're looking at a young man who they said in his mother's womb would never walk right, would never talk right, would never be able to function as a normal human being. And when I came out, they said, this boy is absolutely fine. And my mother named me Jolin, which means joy. I need some people in here today who know how to praise God even though your situation may say something else. You know how to praise God even though you're who can praise God even though the doctor's report may be different? Who can praise God even when your friends don't think you should? As we look here upon this text in Haggai, the second chapter, it's after the destruction of the uh, Jewish nation. 
and they've been in exile in Babylon for 70 years. And these are the people coming back to Israel are, are, are people that, you know, have been enslaved, that have been in this mindset of working, 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 and, and I belong to someone other than God for 70 years. And then the Babylonian Empire crumbles and the Persians take over, and the king decides that they should be allowed to go home. So they return to Israel, and they're trying to rebuild their community. And uh, the first chapter of Haggai talks about how they were um, into their own homes, trying to rebuild everything, trying to get everything back in order as it had previously been. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, God says, build me a temple. The complaining must have been enormous. You think about this entire nation that had been enslaved for 70 years, torment for 70 years, and they finally come back to their homeland, finally come back to where they belong, and they're just trying to, to, to gather everything and, and, and make it like it was before, and they got all of these things on their place. They're trying to just make life normal again, and God thunders into their lives and says, hey, build me a temple. And I know many of you say, hey man, if God told me to do something, man, you know, I'd do it. That's God. You know, if God tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. But would you really? You think about to the story of Jonah, and you think about how God wanted him to preach to the Ninevites, and we always go, why didn't Jonah just listen to God? The common day Comparison would be like me going to preach to the Muslims that are a part of ISIS. And then you look at the story of Paul, and you find that when he was stopped on the road to Damascus by Jesus, that he had been successful before then in his persecution of the Christians, and he had been trained up to be all these things in the Jewish community. And many of us go, well, yeah, Paul was stopped by Jesus. If I was stopped by Jesus, I'd do whatever he wanted to. Of course I'd praise him and proclaim his gospel. But would you destroy all your work that you had been building your entire life to follow Jesus? Because that's what God asked Paul to do. And now God is asking a broken nation to stop the upkeep on their houses and essentially pay off the church. Would you really do what God asks? So the Israelites start building the temple. Feeling good about it, they start building it, and they've been building it for not even a month, and all of a sudden they lose their favor. They lose their passion. They lose their fire for the thing that God has called them to do. Sounds familiar? They lose that fire, that passion, that vigor for the things of God. You know, we start off strong. We, we go to church and we get saved. And we say, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus all the days of my life. We, we get everything in place. We say, hey, I'm going to be a Christian now. I'm going to follow God. And then all of a sudden, we go back home in the aftermath. And we start to talk to our friends. We go back to school. We go back to the workplace. And we get bogged down by all these things. The preacher talked about last night how we lose focus on what God has called us to do because we're so worried about these worldly things. We're so worried about our job. We're so worried about what happens at school. We're so worried about what other people say about us. And that's a big one, Saints. A lot of us are far too worried with, about what other people think. We are far too worried about how others perceive us. We are far too worried about what people will say when we do the things that we need to do for God. But I came here today to tell somebody that you should not care. No matter what anyone tries to do, what, no matter what anyone tries to say, and no matter what anyone thinks about you, keep trying. And marching forward for God because He has called you to be more than a conqueror. He has called you to be a giant slayer. He has called you to be a soldier in His army. And we are soldiers in the army of the Lord. See, it's not enough just going to church. It's not enough just reading that app on your phone. It's not enough just doing the bare minimum. God has called all of us to preach the gospel. The Bible says that we are commanded to preach the gospel. 
live our lives, what we do to other people. The Bible says, for the man that says that he loveth God and hated his brother is a liar. For how can he love God who we have not seen and hate his brother who we have seen? So we need to live the gospel. We need to preach the gospel. We need to think the gospel. And the gospel needs to embody everything we do. I'm talking to somebody today because somebody needs to get this. you got to understand that when you are living the Christian life, you got to understand that when you are going through this thing, you got to understand that when you decide to follow the Messiah, something is about to happen in your life. You know, see, there's a lot of lukewarm saints. I'm going to say that again. There's a lot of lukewarm saints. See, anybody can holler with a devotion or not. That's not speaking in tongues. The Bible says that when people speak in tongues, it should be in pairs of two or three, and that there should be an interpreter in the midst. So if there are four people in the church speaking in tongues, and can nobody interpret nothing, somebody is condemning themselves. See, a lot we got real good about playing church. We got real good about coming into church and wearing the suit. Forget the suit. We don't need that. We don't need the suit. We don't need the fancy things to have church. So as the Israelites continue their construction on this temple, some of them are groaning. Some of them are complaining. Because they remember the old temple. Not only y'all got that, because they remember the old temple. And how the sheer physical glory of the temple that Solomon had erected could not be matched by the lack of resources that they had. And then God says in Haggai 2 and 9, he says, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. Solomon's temple was the jewel of Israel. David had wanted to erect this temple, but God said, no, you are not the man to do it. It was that special, that great. You talk about gold and gems, and the Ark of the Covenant was laid in this temple. It was the grandest temple in all of Jerusalem. And now you have a bunch of refugees that have just returned to their homeland are trying to get things back together have a lack of resources and God says this temple you're building right now is going to be better than the last one could you imagine the bewilderment of the people as they thought about what God said we don't have any of the materials, God. We don't have uh, the number of men. We don't have a king. We don't have any of the things that we had before to build up this great temple for you, God. We, we want to please you. We want to do this for you, God. God, I, I really want to do this for you, but I don't have the means. I can't do that right. I don't have the resources. I don't have the people. And God says, it's going to be better. What was God talking about? God was not talking about the appearance of the temple. Somebody's got to get this. God was not talking about the appearance of the temple. He was not talking about what it looked like. On my way to work, me and my dad passed this church every day. And it's just this great, huge, enormous church, and it looks so nice. And I remember saying, oh, I'm going to pastor a church like that one day. It's awesome. My dad goes, it's not about what the church looks like. The church is the people. that they would not have the resources to make a temple like King Solomon did. God knew that 
that did not have the manpower to erect anything close to what the old temple looked like. God knew that no matter what these people did, that it would not match the sheer physical glory of the old temple. But the thing was, the thing that would make that temple great is that hundreds of years later, Jesus the Christ would walk through the doors of that temple. And I'm here today to tell you that your situation may be down, that your situation may be crestfallen, that you may be going through trials times, but when Jesus the Christ walks through the doors of your life, that you have been changed, that your situations then change. The perception of what people have of that temple is not what makes it great. It doesn't matter what you thought about the temple. It didn't matter what you said about the temple. You could not take the greatness away from it because God had ordained it. God had made this temple, and even though it didn't look like the old temple, the nicer temple, the fancier temple, it was still filled with the Spirit of God. It was the greatest temple that they had erected because Jesus the Christ would be in the midst. And you see, that's, that's the way with a lot of us. We have all these broken down feelings. We have all these walls built up. We have all this garbage surrounding our lives. And we don't look like we got it all together. We don't look like the elders sitting in the gold chairs. We don't look like the missionaries with the scars. We don't look like the evangelists with the leopard mink coats. But I came here today to tell you that Jesus didn't wear a suit. I came here today that they did not wear skirts back then. I came here today to tell you that no matter what you look like, no matter what you have gone through, if Jesus walks into your life, you are going to have a 180 degree turn. No matter what you have done, no matter what you have done it to, no matter what you have said, no matter how, how much wrong that you have committed, if you accept, if you
under and my spirit would be in hell. If God gave me what I deserve, I would not be standing before you today. If God gave me what I deserve, I would be gone a long time ago. If God gave me what I That just because I organized a revival that God owes me something? No. From his throne on high. How comfortable that throne must have been with angels worshiping him. And all creation bowing and leaning on his every word. And he came down for the liars. For the cheaters, for the killers, for the rapists, us. And he lived the perfect life amidst all the sin, muck, and mire. And all he did was try and help us. And you know what we did? Say that again. And he deserved absolutely none of it. Nations were being rained down upon him as all his friends had deserted him. As he took the beatings, as he took the lashings, as he took the stripes, as he took the bruisings, as he took the people calling him names, as he took the nails through his hands, as he took the nails through his feet, as he took the suffer suffocation of his own body upon him and then threw on the weight of the world. Topped with a crown of thorns. Just think about you. And you. You. And me. That's what this is all about. 